Greetings and welcome to the Chronic Graph versus Hostesses webinar. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. You may submit your questions via the webcast at any time by typing them into the Ask a Question field that you see on the left side of your screens. If anyone should require any operator assistance or technical support during the conference, you could press star zero on your telephone keypad if you're connected by the phone, or you could click on the question mark icon on the upper right corner of your screen for technical support information. Please note this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the conference over to our host, Jennifer Gillette, LMSW, for National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Diego, and thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar. We are really excited to bring you this information, and um, today we will be talking about chronic graft versus host disease, managing the symptoms and emotional challenges. Just so everyone knows a basic outline for today's presentation, we'll have just a few minutes of an introduction to the link. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Stephanie Sarantopoulos will enjoy our, uh, present for us on chronic graft versus host disease therapies, new treatments, and clinical trials. And then after her, we will have Sean Kelly, uh, a patient perspective on dealing with chronic graft versus host disease. And then myself giving some tips for coping that I've learned from other uh, people who have called us over the years and given us some great tips. Uh, for anyone who does not know who the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, our mission is dedicated to helping individuals and their families from diagnosis through survivorship. We work with hospitals, cancer centers, individual families, and other organizations by providing resources, support, and education. If there is anything we can assist you with, please feel free to call that number on the side of the slide, as well as you have an email for both our executive director, Peggy Burkhart, and myself, Jennifer Gillette. Some of the resources we have to help families navigate this journey are, we have our chronic graft versus host disease webinars, which you're on today, our podcasts, resources, blogs, and support. We also have our monthly lunch and learns, which are record, uh, recorded and on our website. We have webinars regarding many other topics, including caregiving and, um, and other disease management issues. We have our peer support mentor program for patients and caregivers, our second birthdays recognition program, and uh, we also have plenty of resources, books, and materials, and also can give you referrals. I'd like to uh, thank our webinar event sponsors today, Pharmacyclix, the Insight Corporation, and the Meredith Cowden Foundation, and of course our link partners for all their support in the programs that we uh, share to help everyone. Just a reminder with today's presentation, anything here is not meant as personal medical advice. The presenters do not recommend or endorse any specific products, therapies, websites, or clinical trials. The treatments, therapies, products, trials, and websites mentioned during this webinar are provided as a convenience to you and to promote dialogue between you and your healthcare team, but our doctor is here to guide today, not to give individual medical advice. So without further ado, I am honored to introduce Dr. Stephanie Sarantopoulos, who is an associate professor in medicine at Duke University in the Division of Hematological Malignancies and Stem Cell Therapy. She received her MD and PH degrees, or PhD degrees from Boston University School of Medicine and completed her fellowship in hematology and oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where she served as attending physician in bone marrow transplantation. At Duke University, she is currently an attending physician in the adult bone marrow transplant clinic and inpatient unit, and the primary investigator of the NIH R01 funder investigated initiated clinical trial. She directs the Duke GVHD multidisciplinary research care team and is the co-lead of the hematological malignancies and cellular therapy research program at the Duke Cancer Institute. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Stephanie. Oh, thanks very much for having me. I 
it's a pleasure really to be here and I wanted to say um, thank you for joining everyone and also thank you for you to your organization for all you do every day for patients with chronic graft-versus host disease. Um, first I'll start by saying I think if you're on this call you probably have chronic graft-versus host disease or someone you love has the disease so you probably know a bit about it um, and there is a, a series of podcasts that the the uh, link has put forward, uh, including the two that I show here by Dr. Um, Flowers and uh, Dr. M. Can you see that slide? Uh, it, I can't tell if you're seeing that slide, so I'm just going to say that. Oh, you yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> just making sure because I see. Okay. So I just want to point you to those two links if, if you want to know about incidents and um, a few more details about sort of how the disease develops, please go to those two links. Um, today, what I wanted to do was really um, talk a little bit more about the science behind chronic graft-versus-host disease at sort of a high level, not to get into the weeds about some of the immunology, but really to just inform you about how the science has really guided us as practitioners, but um, how there are lots of folks, including myself, um, who are doing research addressing the problem of chronic graft-versus-host disease in, in the hopes of bringing more um, viable agents to you as uh, patients. Uh, to do that, you know, I'm going to tell you first about um, how a uh, donor allogeneic stem cell transplant uh, works, and a lot of you know this, but I think it's worth reminding you that the donor or the graft is uh, genetically different from you, the host, and the, or the patient. Um, and that genetic difference is the reason why uh, this is a very important and uh, curative therapy for a variety of blood and marrow problems, including cancers. So we call graft-versus-leukemia effect the immune effect that's desired because that gets rid of your cancer. The problem is that the host is also a target of that graft uh, that comes from the donor, and the uh, organs are targeted and damaged in the form of what is called graft-versus-host disease. Uh, there are two types of graft-versus-host disease, and we're not going to talk about acute graft-versus-host disease in any um, detail today, except to say that that is the uh, primary uh, suggest, you know, indicator that you will go on to get chronic graft-versus-host disease if you did have acute graft-versus-host disease. But this problem is clinically distinct um, from what happens to patients who later develop chronic graft-versus-host disease. So, is a problem that uh, looks more like an autoimmune disease and happens temporarily later after transplant. Um, the, the reason why um, we, we can tell that chronic graft-versus-host disease is different is the way the patients appear. However, the biology is probably very linked and we are actively trying to investigate that in the laboratory. Um, you, you all know that we give the stem cell product uh, to you so that you can recover your red cells and your platelets. You know that we also want you to recover your immune cells. And I'll just make the point again that um, you know, we can trans, uh, transfuse you platelets and red cells. We can't transfuse you white cells. And when we have the adult primitive stem cell that we give you um, develop within the foreign host, um, we are able to reconstitute your immune system, but that happens under constant exposure um, to foreign uh, sort of proteins and tissues, and that's why you get graft-versus-host disease. And for those of you with the disease, this picture is all too familiar. This is a very debilitating multi-organ system problem, and you've probably seen this picture before. Um, it comes courtesy of Steve Pavletic at the National Cancer Institute, and it really highlights the many organs that can be involved in chronic graft-versus-host disease. So ocular uh, findings or eye findings, mouse ulcerations and um, that can be quite debilitating. Other findings in the skin, including the nail. Uh, you can have discrete plaques or redness and bumpy rash, um, or uh, the, the patho uh, mnemonic or the uh, diagnostic feature that is called deep sclerosis. Sclerotic chronic graft-versus-host disease is a rarer entity, but when it happens, it is quite debilitating, stopping patients from uh, being able to move their limbs properly, walk, and even inhale um, properly, not, not able to take a deep breath because your trunk is affected by sort of what is and looks like kind of scar tissue. In addition to that kind of uh, finding that would inhibit respiration, you can have lung 
uh, damage that is in the form of bronchiolitis obliterans. And on the right there, I show a, um, that's a slide of uh, tissue that's under the microscope, basically just highlighting that small airways are obstructed um, by acellular uh, matter that really blocks your ability to get air exchange. And then below that is the bile ducts of the liver in a, in a microscopic slide there that just basically reminds me to tell you that the other life-sustaining organ that can be involved in this disease is the liver. Um, in addition to the skin that can be quite um, stiff and make it hard for you to move around, the deep tissue, um, so fasci fascial uh, uh, fascia that surrounds the muscle and helps you kind of be able to move your muscles can be scarred down and affected and limit mobility and your skin can be quite ulcerated as you know. Um, these findings, when you look at them, you think of scar, you think of um, something that might not be reversible, but what we've learned over years is um, that there is a reversibility to uh, this kind of a skin finding. So I focus on that a little bit because I can imagine that those of you with that finding would be somewhat discouraged, but I'll tell you that there is a reversibility to that, especially with novel agents that we have. Um, and listed in words here in this box are your infection, disability, all the things that you feel and that you know um, are, are driving um, you to the physician constantly. Um, there is also um, a problem with memory sometimes with patients and with uh, sort of uh, dealing with having such a debilitating disease um, and lots of patients have uh, post-traumatic stress and they have depression and that's also something that needs to be addressed that's not depicted here but I'll just point out that without our colleagues in um, palliative care and with mental health um, professionals we would also not be able to take um, good care of our patients. So it's not something to point out. So if you're experiencing any of those issues, you're not alone. It's a common problem and it's something that we can address as providers collectively. This slide is really just to remind me that all that supportive care that we try to provide to you um, collectively, again, we've learned a lot over the years um, from uh, one another and from you as patients and from studies that we've done observing what happens with patients and how best to support you. Um, that is work being done by the uh, chronic GVHD consensus group and um, there are reports that have been written. This is, just happens to be one of them uh, by a couple of the leaders in the field and I just show it to you to remind you that that's work that's being done. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that but just know that it's happening. That. Um, in addition to supportive care efforts that are um, being investigated or in efforts that are being put forth, um, we are also interested in perpetual immune deficiency um, that is associated with just having a transplant, whether you have overt or obvious chronic reference host disease or not, you are immune compromised. Um, and that is because you had a transplant and, you, and that, that's why I showed you that slide about the, the donor graft uh, under constant exposure to foreign tissue and antigens and, and that battle that's going on is, you know, hopefully not uh, clinically relevant or manifesting, but if you are a person who has symptoms or signs of an infection or you have a fever, it does warrant a little expert um, advice here and there. So you don't want to leave it go if you have um, signs of infection because you are, uh, for life, an immune compromised individual. Um, and so. You know, how have we learned all these things? Again, I wanted to make a very, very strong point here that the National Institutes of Health, um, you know, where your tax dollars go to the government really does make a big difference. They recognize chronic graft versus host disease, the NIH does, as a, a problem and as an, an immune deficiency disorder that needs a lot of attention both in the laboratory and both in, and in clinical trials. And so there is uh, earmarked money for this problem. and uh, a lot of the work that's being done is being forged by the collective and we're a collaborative group of investigators and um, providers who are, are working towards finding solutions to this problem and Steve Pavletic is at the helm so he's at Na National Cancer Institute and he's been forwarding this and for years Steve has been um, looking at patients with his natural history study and that sort of helped characterize the disease in great detail which has really helped us now convince companies to supply us with agents to test. Um, and, you know, when we look at the patients and we see all the organs that are affected, we not only work together as bone marrow transplant physicians on the problem, but we also, 
elicit help from um, others who are very expert at different disease, um, I'm sorry, different organs. Um, and so at Duke, for example, many centers have multidisciplinary uh, clinic groups uh, that address patients with chronic arthrosis. We have that. Um, we have a skin doctor, Dr. Cardona. So we have a pathologist even who's on the consensus group, um, Dr. Cardona. We have an ophthalmologist. We have pulmonary doctors. We have, uh, you know, infectious disease and rheumatology doctors. Um, it's an important thing to have for the to provide expert care for our patients, but it's also something that has helped us um, collectively address the problem on a research level. So we call our group, you know, the Duke GVHD Multidisciplinary Research Care Team, and research is in that um, in the title of our marked, uh, dis, you know, multidisciplinary clinic. And the reason is um, we have used the clinic as a way to to um, bring patients in for. Uh, evaluation to get expert care and to help us as well with some research. And so that is because we study uh, patient samples and patient um, excess tissue and samples. So when a patient comes to the clinic and gets a blood draw and agrees to participate, um, they kindly give us extra blood. We also get some large volume um, leukophoresis samples from other institutions from patients who kindly agree to participate in studies. Um, and over the years, that has helped us drive some of the um, work by many investigators, including um, investig the, the investigator called Kelly McDonald, who made this beautiful um, picture and published it. And it's basically a depiction of lots of years of work and, and you know, sort of showing the many cellular targets and other soluble factor potential targets in the disease that we might develop agents for. Um, and just to say that Dr. McDonald does mouse work, so without mouse work, we also would not be anywhere in the disease, so we do studies in primary human um, samples. We also do studies in mice collectively as a group, and we put our heads together and we say these are the pathways of interest, and we can target maybe a T cell or a B cell or a macrophage, or we can potentially try to prevent things like that sclerosis or fibrosis that I was showing you in that patient. Um, so. Acute graft host disease morphing into chronic graft host disease is really sort of on the uh, in the in the in the organ you know in the person but in the mouse you know where where we understand the uh, cooperation between the two when we look at a patient we can tell that you have chronic graft host disease not acute but this is just to say all the things that happen early uh, in the post transplant period are probably what perpetuate and incite incite first start the disease process and then perpetuate it over time. And those are things that we're thinking a lot about because we want to try to prevent chronic graphosis. That's sort of our holy grail. And I told you that I do some research and this is, um, you know, a, a slide again, uh, just to give you the sense of how we're doing things and, and where we think this might be going. Um, we are very interested in targeting cells that are signaling abnormally, and one particular cell of interest is the B cell, and that cell has a receptor on it called the B cell receptor that actually binds to foreign antigens, and, and we have found that those cells are abnormally signaling and that they signal through a molecule called SIC, um, and that was information um, gleaned from studies of primary human samples and then um, affirmed in a mouse model with many collaborators across the country and the world. And then uh, as a group, we um, collected enough data to convince a company to give us the agent to test in clinical trials. And the NIH is uh, funding that clinical trial, and it's ongoing. Um, we hope that the information we get will basically tell us that the agent is safe the clinical trial is not addressing at all efficacy or how it works, um, but we are doing some studies with the trial that should address that and help guide us some for the next trial. And this commentary that was written by Dr. Pavletic about this work really gets to an even nicer uh, question that we'd like to answer, a bigger question. One is, can we get rid of um, graft or disease or stop it from starting at all um, by targeting a cell like the B cell, um, and at the same time maybe stop cancer from returning in patients who have cells that are also signaling in an abnormal way through the B cell receptor, for example. 
or that signal through sick that may be non-B cell cancers like AML and other cancers that signal through sick. So we're looking for trying to get, you know, we're trying to get maybe a, a twofer here and try to prevent both graft versus host disease and cancer relapse with some of these agents. And we're not alone in this um, quest. Lots of people are looking at other agents. And again, in my 15 years doing chronic graft versus host disease um, research, I'll just tell you that this is a really an amazing Happen, happening over uh, the last five to ten years, probably the last five years the most exciting, where we've gotten lots of interest from uh, companies who have agents that we can potentially uh, repurpose to uh, treat and prevent chronic graft versus host disease, but also that have aided in our further understanding of the disease process. And this slide is a, from a review article by Corey Cutler at Dana-Farber, who summarizes nicely some of the cellular targets uh, and some of the agents that potentially either augment or block um, these cells that are involved in chronic graft versus host disease. And in the so-called pipeline, you know, the, how, how long or, or not in the, how long, but in the process of getting an agent from studies in the laboratory to patients in clinical trials, uh, we have been successful collectively in getting uh, ibrutinib the BTK inhibitor um, approved by the FDA. Uh, that's the one agent uh, to date over many years uh, since the description of chronic graft versus host disease is the one agent that is approved for steroid refractory chronic graft versus host disease. The other agent that is um, interesting and has been FDA approved for acute graft versus host disease is ruxolitinib or Jacophy. Um, and you know there are many other agents in the pipeline that are being studied actively and uh, at different institutions and across institutions. And so I make the plug to patients on the call to participate when possible and when you're eligible for a clinical trial because it certainly is um, moving the field forward and it also will expose you to agents that um, may turn out to be efficacious and viable agents for you. And then I, I wanted to switch gears with the last two slides a little bit just to give you an idea of what we do and what we think about when you come to the multidisciplinary clinics and when you come to your clinic, um, which we hope you do often and, and to make the plug to go often. We know that patients who live uh, farther away from their transplant center perhaps do less well. Someone's published this actually, so think about it. You want to go to the clinic as often as, uh, at regular intervals when your um, providers ask you to come back, but actually even when you feel well. And the reason for that is um, several fold, but um, one thing that I've learned over the years and you patients have taught me is that many of you feel pretty unwell on a day-to-day -day basis, fatigued, and it's hard to tell if something's changing um, in real time. Uh, so sometimes just these regular intervals are when we pick things up uh, in the clinic, and we do that um, with several uh, tests that are now uh, substantiated to be very important and impactful for you. So in this table that comes from, or figure that comes from a medical article um, that uh, we put together with Keith Sullivan, actually, who uh, trained at, who, who actually was one of the first people to describe chronic graft versus host disease when he was at the Fed, Fred Hutch in Seattle. Um, Keith um, had, had the idea we should put together an article talking about um, the treatment of steroid refractory uh, chronic graft versus these patients. And in doing that, we thought, well, what are the things that have changed the way we treat patients? And these are some of them. And it is on the left there, if you look, there's uh, red flags and so things that make us act promptly um, and also preempt things. So they may not be Things, you know, just to tell you, if you're a patient out there, don't be alarmed if you're not getting this checked every time. These are done at certain intervals, and it's a patient-specific sort of regimen of tests that we perform, but um, we definitely do pulmonary function tests. That's an A, the FEV1 and the forced expiration volume. Those are lung tests that we do, um, and patients often ask me, why are you doing them every six months? And sometimes even more frequently, I feel well, I don't have a cough, I don't have a breathing problem, but you insist on doing these. Um, the reason we do is we have uh, substantiated evidence, again, gleaned from the consensus group, from the consortia um, headed by Kirsten Williams and others, and published in New England Journal. We know that when the FEV1, for example, part of the pulmonary function test drops, it reflects 
uh, something that's going on in the small airways sort of depicted in a cartoon fashion in the middle, the blockage of the small airways is reflected in this simple test. And that test tells us we should start instituting prophylactic or preventative kind of not pr it, 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 treatments, basically. And, and some of you may know the uh, acronym SAM because you're on it. And it's basically a steroid inhaler, azithromycin and monolucast. FAM has been shown and published in New England Journal to impact uh, the trajectory of how your, your lung function goes. So it can halt you know, worsening of lung function. And it's super important. And it's been um, because of clinical trials that we were able to glean that. But you should know that's why we do that test. So come and get that test. And then blood tests, of course, we get. You know, B is the liver test that you won't feel any different if it's if your total bilirubin is high or not, but we're going to test it, and if we see it's high, we're going to do some things. And so the additional work up on the right may or may not happen, but it definitely is something that prompts us to think about performing those tests um, if those liver tests are abnormal. Just in the same way, is if your platelets and D are you know abnormally low, that is a harbinger of potentially worse, worsening disease coming down in the near future, and that makes us think about things, um, including infectious things and other things um, that are potentially reversible, but also to think about whether or not your chronic GVHD is actually worsening, because there is a potential that uh, the immune system is targeting your bone marrow or your platelets themselves, and we like to know about that. So platelets are a very important prognostic factor for us, and it's something we look at often. And then in C, we definitely look at your weight and think about why you might be losing weight, and that is definitely something that uh, prompts further testing, especially if there's associated diarrhea with that. And the final sort of slide that comes again from the same medical article, and, it, and I'm not going to really go through the details of this particular slide, but I leave it here for you to have, but I want you to know that we, in the charts and in our visits with you, are, are, are trying to objectively score you using what we've learned from the NIH consensus group meetings and publications. And we use an NIH score that is sort of templated within our electronic charts to go through each of your organ systems, either scored by a question we ask you, how many times do you use an eye drop a day, that's one of the ways we score you, or by something more objective like a lab test like the total bilirubin that I mentioned. Um, and whether or not these things are uh, moderate or severe dictates whether we initiate treatment, and it also dictates whether or not we think you're responding to therapy, and that kind of guides us in terms of what we may do in terms of decreasing your steroid uh, dose, perhaps, or adding on another agent if we think that things are not improving. Um, I, I put this here really for everyone to sort of think about um, the, tr the timing of how things move in chronic graft host disease. And you know better than I, it's slow moving typically. Um, with the exception of life sustaining organ involvement like liver and lung, we typically don't move very fast in uh, chronic graft host disease treatment changes. And, and there's a reason for that. And it is that we need to see over time how things are going. And we need to have some time for modulation to happen with a given agent that has been started. So a little bit of patience is often required in terms of reversing things like that scleroderma that took a, um, probably didn't take that long to develop when it developed, but it takes a bit of time to reverse, and so we need sometimes time to see if our agent is working. And, and then in terms of some of the other uh, non-systemic uh, treatments, we also need expert help and time to see if some of those things are actually working for our patients as well. Um, so I think that's really what I wanted to say, just to tell you that very linked to what we do in clinic is sort of our understanding of the disease and that, um, you know, this title is, is not meant to discourage but to tell you um, that it is a lifelong process. And there is a lot of hope for you to reverse and get better, for sure, but we need to partner with you and individually um, make a regimen for you and see you often. Uh, and then to, to know, if you didn't already know, that there are lots of people, including the NIH folks and people funded by the NIH who are working on this problem, and then the consensus uh, 
or not the consensus, the consortium, that's the chronic GVHD consortium headed by Stephanie Lee at the Hutch, um, and you probably already know about the advocacy group and research uh, advocate, uh, the Cowden Foundation. There are groups specifically interested in this problem who are forging efforts on the research side of things. Um, and then, you know, in the pictures here, the unsung heroes, these are people from my lab who are extremely um, undervalued for all the work they do, but they are really the ones kind of making the, the motions that will bring things down the pipeline to you as, as patients. So I appreciate your listening to me, and I hope that I can answer some questions for you, um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarantopoulos. I want to invite our next speaker, Sean Kelly, who is a survivor, uh, to uh, share with you how he has coped with chronic graft-versus-host disease. Sean, thank you for joining us. Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, I don't know how I can really follow up that from Dr. Stephanie, but uh, other than from my point of view, um, but I do want to say thanks to her uh, and just from my standpoint, um, when I first talked to her, it was really eye-opening, mostly just because I, it, I appreciate um, and it made me, it feels good to know that so much is being done um, around graft versus host disease. I think sometimes we feel like it's a like nobody's ever heard of it. You say you have all these problems and people are like, what are you talking about? I've never heard of this disease. And because it's really, I don't know, I guess relatively kind of a new thing. Um, I don't know. Sometimes it, it, it just feels good to, to know that there's so many people out there that are worried about people like us and that um, gives you hope for um, uh, hopefully something happening down the road that will make life better for us. Um, so anyways, my um, story, uh, I, I, uh, I'm currently 49 years old. I live in Massachusetts. Um, I am married. I have a wife, Julie, who's been <laughs> with me through all this, thankfully, and my kids, Neil, Max, and Marin, who have been through as much, if not more, than me through all of this. And um, it, it made it hard being a father and being married, you know, for all this to happen to all of us. And that's one of my, you know, uh, things that I have been hardest for me is seeing what it's done to my family over the years, but I, I also know that I couldn't have gotten through it without them, so just wanted to say thanks to all of them real quick. Um, I live in Massachusetts, like I said. I graduated from a, a Worcester Polytechnic Institute, a school here in Worcester, Mass. Um, I've worked in the computer industry since mid-90s. Um, I was working, I, I, I worked as a VP of operations at a small startup, a cloud provider uh, for many years throughout my diagnosis and, and transplant. And um, honestly, they, I couldn't have done it without them either. The, the, I, I was lucky enough to live with, to work at a company that was very understanding and patient. And um, anyways, so I was at the time I, I, I was I was diagnosed in 2011. Um, so I was 41 at the time. I've always been very active uh, with family and kids' activities, coaching. Coached all my kids in soccer and baseball, basketball from when they were little. Um, like to fish and fly fish and golf. Um, so when all this happened, that when I was 41, um, it was um, definitely quite a, a surprise. Um, so it ha I was, uh, it was the day after my 41st birthday when I uh, had been feeling tired uh, and, and had had a couple of episodes of um, uh, very lightheadedness to the point of actually almost fainting, blacking out, and uh, finally uh, went to the hospital 
I went to the emergency room, <clears throat> um, <laughs> drove there, which I probably shouldn't have, uh, but I got there, and my wife met, we met me there, and um, after uh, a couple of hours and tests, um, <laughs> I guess luckily or not, uh, the, the ER doctor that was on call um, or that was on duty had been an ex-hematology, oncology doctor, uh, who just happened to be working in an emergency part of, department in my local hospital and um, told me that after looking at my blood tests, he's like, a, I hate to say this, but I, I'm pretty sure you have leukemia. <laughs> and honestly, my first first words were, leukemia, that's cancer, right? <laughs> I had no idea what it was. I didn't know anything about it. I and I'm sure everyone on this call or those of you that are in the same boat as me have a very similar story and probably got thrown into the world of leukemia and blood cancer more quickly than you ever could have imagined and learned more about it than you ever thought you could. Anyways, uh, I was rushed by hospital that night, uh, I mean by ambulance to, the, to a, a local hospital here in Worcester, uh, University of Massachusetts, UMass Medical Center. Uh, it's the largest medical provider in Central Mass, um, and the closest um, uh, large hospital. So they they rushed me there. Uh, by you know after a night of tests and then bone marrow biopsy the next morning, I was on chemotherapy the next evening. So within a little over 24 hours, I went from not knowing what was going on to uh, being hooked up to drugs that <laughs> almost kill you. So um, I spent the first 30 days in the hospital uh, doing the induction portion of it, where I was, it was everything was killed off. I was in remission, and um, thank God ever since. And uh, went home, went back for another five-day consolidation round of chemo. A uh, month and a half later, and then they found my donor, um, a young man in Germany, <laughs> of all places. Uh, he was a perfect match for me, and um, I was scheduled to go in for my transplant uh, in December. That so was four months after I was diagnosed. I got my transplant uh, just before Christmas in 2011 and um, went home. In New, uh, just after New Year's of 2012. So up to that point, yeah, it sucked. I mean, I'm sure everyone on this call understands or has been through it, understands what a what hell it can be to, to go through all that. But then I thought everything was going okay. And I made it through my first 100 days, and there was no acute GVHD. And we all celebrated, and I thought, we thought everything was good. It was in May that year, so five months after I went home from the hospital, that I started experiencing symptoms of GVHD, and then it's been ever since then. So for the past seven years, I've been dealing with it. Um, first, my first symptoms were eyes. Um, I started getting really uh, red eyes, and then it became painful. And um, I went to a local ophthalmologist who just happened to be, well, she's an excellent, excellent ophthalmologist, but just happened to know what she was looking at and um, diagnosed, diagnosed me with ocular GVHD. Um, and then soon after that, maybe a couple months later, I started having um, noticing lung problems, having a harder time uh, walking, getting out of breath, um, that sort of thing. Started getting pain uh, in my muscles, my legs, uh, walking, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, skin thickening um, soon after that. Started having the lesions and the rashy look um, uh, all over my skin. So that was the how I got there, got here. <laughs> and then since then, 
um, I guess, coping with it. Uh, it's, as you know, a lot of doctor's appointments. Um, uh, I will say the fact that I, um, we chose, so let me go back a little bit. Um, after the first month's stay, um, we uh, went to Dana-Farber um, in Boston and spoke to an, uh, a doctor that had seen my particular mutation and um, after a lot of thought, um, the fact that he was the treatment plan was going to be very much the same as what they were proposing at UMass, where they also have a large transplant center, um, we made the decision to stay in Worcester to stay at UMass, mostly because um, it allowed my wife and my family and friends and everyone else to come and visit me all the time. Whereas if I was in Boston, um, you know, it would have been definitely not as frequent. And I feel like that, for me personally, that helped me get through a lot of it. Um, it, it, you know, the medical care, you know, getting the transplant um, essentially with the same uh, plan that they had at Dana Farber, the the fact that I could be surrounded by people that kind of carried me through, just uh, really meant the world. So, and since then, <laughs> having all the other doctor's appointments that have come with it, uh, it's definitely, you know, it's been helpful to be. I felt very lucky, very fortunate to be in an area where medical care is. Um, so readily available. And I realize a lot of you probably aren't. And I, I, that must be really hard. Um, so in addition to all my regular appointments, um, after I developed GVHD, I started seeing a lot of um, specialists. I now see specialists at Mass General for, um, for my skin. I see a, a specialist at uh, Mass Eye and Ear for my eyes. So it's definitely been helpful to be in an area where I have such, you know, access to such good care. Um, anyways, going to all these doctor's appointments, I, you learn a lot. I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, it, it, it definitely helps to stay on top of all that and take, um, you know, notes, Learn a lot. Learn as much as you can. Um, luckily, I had my wife, like I said, my brother Ryan, um, who really helped me, you know, get through a lot of that. Uh, Sister-in-law was a doctor. <laughs> Just tons of, you know, resource. But it's like drinking from water hose. I'm sure you all know. And and the, uh, you just have to, you know, get as much information as you can so you can make the best decisions that you can. Um, I tried a lot of different things over the years. I've done trials. I did. Dr. Stephanie spoke about NIH. I, I went down to the NIH in Maryland for a drug trial uh, for a while. Um, I've, you know, been offered other trials up here at, at Dana Farber and uh, Mass Eye and Ear, and tried a ton of different drugs through my local oncologist. Eventually, something works. Um, she mentioned uh, Jacophy. That's the thing that happened to work for me, but I had tried a whole lot of other things. Um, some that worked some, some that worked at first and then stopped working. Um, for my eyes, eyes have been really hard. Nothing, you know, none of the medicines work. None of the therapies or treatments really did a lot. I mean, they help, but they don't, nothing really you know, it's very drastic. I ended up getting these what are called pros lenses, which are these scleral lenses that kind of hold moisture against your eye. It's like this big, giant contact lens. And um, that ended up being the thing that, that worked for me. Some people can't use them because they're hard to get in and 
whatever, but that ended up working for me. So I guess the point is, you know, you just got to keep trying, keep trying things. Um, talk to people, talk to anyone, everyone. <laughs> uh, doctors, you know, I really tried to pay a lot of attention to what my doctor's saying. I was very involved in, um, you know, a lot of back and forth and um, really tried to learn a lot of the science and, the, and understand what really was going on. Uh, but then even other patients, you know, I, like I, I thought you think you're crazy until you hear somebody else say, oh, yeah, I get like terrible cramps at night. I, like I, I thought I, you know, I, I get really bad cramping in my feet and my hands and things like that. And it wasn't until I heard another patient say, oh, yeah, like a lot of us get that, that I knew I wasn't crazy. You know, I knew it wasn't just me. Um, nurses, you know, I, you, you learn a lot from nurses in addition to them being the ones that just help you get through it all. <laughs> um, so yeah, ask a lot of questions. Um, family, like I said, I really tried to focus on family, you know, like and it, them helping me get through it, but also me trying to stay engaged in um, everything that was going on at the house and what's going on, basically not in a hospital room and not <laughs> with me, um, the more I think you can kind of get beyond your, uh, you know, getting sucked down into the, your own pains. Um, Dr. Stephanie talked about depression. I've battled that over the years for sure. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it's, it takes a lot. It, it takes active effort to, to not let yourself get sucked down. Um, and lots of support from, like I said, loved ones, friends, church. We just had so many people show up from from our church, you know, with meals and all sorts of things. Friends doing fundraisers for us, people that, you know, we weren't even great friends with coming out and just helping it, you know, don't be afraid to take support from people. I think I tend to push back, whereas my wife really embraces that. And um, it's helped us a lot over the years, for sure. Um, and then living with GVHD, um, <laughs> first of all, this, this picture, this cartoon down here on the right, my wife's cousin, who's a... a an animator, a, a graphic artist, did that uh, <laughs> when I was in the hospital. It was a little. I had that hanging up on my my uh, on the wall was when I was laying in, in bed in the hospital. Um, but yeah, you know, trying to stay active, um, trying to walk as much as I can, um, which isn't a whole lot. You know, on a good day, it might be a mile, mile and a half still. Um, fishing, you know, <laughs> it's my thing, but it, it gets me outside, you know, fly fishing gets me into the river wading, and it's, you know, it's exercise, it's activity, it's something to, to focus on, and, um, you know, but whatever works, whatever works for you. Um, working, you know, not, it, 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 it definitely, <laughs> well, you get pulled back more than you want to, I'm sure, as most of you know, but um, I, you know, being able to work some, like I said, my employer was very uh, understanding, so being able to kind of come back at my own pace uh, definitely helped me to feel uh, normal, I guess. I think it, and it helped my family, too, to some extent, to, to feel like things were okay. Um, Dad's going back to the office today, you know, that kind of thing. Um, focus on the positive, like I said. You know, focus on what you can do, not what you can't. Um, being thankful for what you have, not what you don't. And that's, like I said, a, it's been a conscious effort for me. I try to, every day, you know, do affirmations, like just like make a point to think about things that I'm thankful for. And it 
takes your mind off of things that you don't want to, <laughs> that you're very not thankful for. Um, online support, Facebook support groups like this, podcasts, webinars. Um, you know, I never would have thought, I sitting on this webinar last year, I wouldn't have thought I would be doing it this year myself. But, um, you know, it's uh, anything, any anybody that you can talk to, um, I've found it, it helps. And then other things, music, audio books, thank goodness for audio books, because until I got my lenses especially, I had a very hard time reading, so I had to use audio books. Um, you know, you kind of do what you have to do. You figure out ways to, to do things that you might not be able to do normally. Um, and then just don't be too hard on yourself, you know. Remember that it's hard. There's no easy answers. Everyone's different. It's okay to be tired. You know, some days you just don't want to get out of bed, or some days you just want to stay on the couch with the dogs or whatever. Um, you know, that's okay. And um, just keep fighting. That's it. That's all I had. Oh, Sean, thank you so much. I, I appreciate your authenticity, and um, I'm sure that you and Dr. Stephanie are both helping a lot of people today. For the sake of we're going to try to um, get to as many questions that we can today, I'm going to try to just skim through mine, because frankly, I think Sean just nailed it in the coping perspective. But uh, my name is Jennifer Gillette again, and I'm the staff social worker at the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. And I've been in oncology for over 20 years, and I'm an email or a phone call away. So if anybody wants to reach out, I am here to assist you. Um, just like Sean, as you can tell, uh, you know, our survivors are certainly our best teachers, and we also like to just reiterate that, you know, your, your journey, it's like your fingerprint. It's very unique, and so there's certainly a no one-size-fits-all answer here. Uh, but we, we like to share what's been a success for some people so that hopefully it can try to help you on your journey. Um, we have heard from many patients that they thought this transplant was supposed to make them better and that they are frustrated that they're dealing with chronic graft-versus-host disease. 40% um, of uh, patients get chronic graft-versus-host disease, and it can last for years or a lifetime. And its symptoms can range from annoying to severe. But as you heard, we are getting much and more advanced as to how we are treating it. We need to have a realistic view of what coping is, though. It takes time for your body to heal, and so it also takes time for your soul. You have to remember, it's like you've experienced a pers personal earthquake. Um, you develop an increased tolerance for the unknown as you deal with multiple losses and consistent pressure. One second here. So living and thriving with chronic graft versus host disease basically means to find out how to live, live the best version of you making the best of what your body can do, finding ways to cope, minimizing emotional distress, finding ways to reconnect with the world around you, and establishing a renewed sense of meaning and purpose in your life. Uh, there is one person who taught me this best. I remember we have a survivor named Rhonda who shared with us a story about her being in her hospital bed. And uh, she had just had her transplant and after, she realized certain things like sitting in a chair made her feel stronger physically than being in the bed. So she would push herself to be in that chair a little bit longer each day to try to grow physically. And if, if you look at it like that, if you just keep trying to stretch a little and trying to um, just be the best version of you, that is the way to move forward. It's learning how to walk in balance with persistence, patience, hope, and acceptance. I think of a, another wonderful peer of ours, David, who talked about how important it is to um, be aware of what energy you have and what you can do. Uh, you know, he, he would be persistent trying to do things that had meaning, but he had to learn that his body only could handle so much in a day, and if he overdid it, he would pay for two or three days. 
So learning how to walk in that balance and accepting what your body's capable of. We also recommend attending conferences um, because just like Sean was saying, that's where you can just continue to get an abundance of information. Uh, I know the Cowdens have a great event, BMT InfoNet, LLS. Uh, there's so many great conferences that you can learn from. And of course, resources out there, like we have a great um, chronic graph versus host book uh, that we'd be happy to send anyone that reaches out to us. We also, if you go on our website, I know Peggy had listed it um, while the other speakers were talking, uh, we have a great um, podcast series all dedicated to chronic graft versus host disease, and it's called Marrow Masters, and there's some great information on there as well. So setting realistic expectations, finding out what your new pace is, your ability um, with your current situation, reclaiming important areas of your life uh, while allowing for flexibility and creativity. And that might be, uh, again, I think of Rhonda, how she got a little stronger each day and now she has completed a marathon in each state uh, as of June. And, but it was from that mindset of just, I'm gonna push a little more and a little more and just try to work with what my body is ready for. Uh, it's also important to understand that everyone that loves you walks this journey with you. You may all cope differently, but work together as a team to support each other. We also have a podcast coming out here too, just an FYI on uh, how to help your marriage during something like this, because there's definitely skills that can help the two of you overcome the many hurdles that a transplant journey uh, provides. Know when to ask for help and learn to say no. If you're not up to something, it's okay to draw limits and to set boundaries. So I'm going to just highlight a couple things from each slide. Uh, for those of you who are interested, in, there is something on your screen that says event resources and you can print these slides. But just to give you a couple of the tips from some of the great survivors who have worked with us, uh, this is a picture of Jennifer Barish, one of our great peer mentors. And she has recommended, first of all, uh, keeping a list of the gains that you make so that you don't get overly discouraged. Just like, you know, if you look at your children growing, if you see them every day, you don't really necessarily notice. But then when grandma comes over after a couple of months, she said, wow, they shot up. It's the same thing when you're going through this journey. There's going to be things that you slowly gain each day. And so really celebrating those victories. Also understanding um, what your body needs to do well. When Jen went back to work, um, she had talked about how she learned that she had to rest her eyes from the computer. Many of you that deal with that IGDHD um, certainly can understand that, I'm sure, and had to walk around and modify some of her time where sometimes she was in the office and sometimes at home. She also really recommended, uh, we have an eight-part series on YouTube called The New Normal, and that video was really helpful to her. And to look at this as a marathon and not a sprint, don't expect yourself to just bounce back after a transplant. Uh, there's many people that get discouraged if they think that they're just gonna bounce back quickly, and if you pace yourself, you're more likely to have success. And we have a lovely picture of Meredith from the Meredith Howden Foundation who her tips have been to make sure you understand what are peak times of the day for yourself. So when you're making appointments or trying to get things done, set yourself up for success that way. Also giving yourself breaks, prioritizing, and breaking bigger tasks into small tasks. Um, she also is a fond um, believer of Brene Brown's book about being the author in your own life. Um, you know, you can certainly choose how to handle what comes to you. And, um, and then discover what brings meaning, joy, and hope. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. And there's something that you bring unique to this world. So I, I encourage you to look for that. I know I've learned that tip from my sister as well. I have a sister that is homebound. And um, she volunteers in a program where she 
called shut-ins, and she actually saved someone's life before uh, because that person had fallen and no one would have known uh, if they didn't have people calling in on her. And so my sister could sit there and think about all the things she can't do, but there's plenty of things that she can do, and she has been an inspiration to me. We also have some tips from David. David uh, was in the corporate world, and he has traded that in after his transplant at his second chance at life, serving others and sharing his passion for healthy living. He encourages you to find ways to stimulate your brain, look for positives, to try to be social. He was walking and moving the transplant floor for sure. Uh, David volunteers with a series project which helps teach cancer patients and others how to eat healthy to best take care of their bodies while they're healing. And um, he is one that has really encouraged people to just listen to your body. He also uh, really um, encourages peer mentors, people that have been through it before that you can talk to, which MBMT, we do have wonderful peer mentors, and um, to consider counseling because sometimes there's just some skills that you might need to learn that are not already in your toolbox. And then Lou. Lou is another wonderful peer we have here at the link. He, um, he found out that his cancer was caused from being at 9-11 um, in New York, and he, he viewed his transplant as a recall to life. He and his wife had the attitude of doing whatever it takes to fight this chronic graft-versus-host disease and cancer together and he believes in a strong support team. He would try to choose projects to distract himself, and he's always been very active. He's in support groups and senior groups, and one of the fun things Lou had shared with us, too, is with that giving back spirit that many of you have after this transplant. Uh, he has an app he's downloaded. It's a Charity Miles app where he walks, and um, large corporations donate to charities of your choice by the level of walking you do. And that encourages him to take care of his health, but also try to give back to others. So another important tool is knowing how to communicate well with your healthcare team. You know, it's really important to maximize that time you have with them and to be as efficient as possible. It's also really important to communicate clearly and honestly with your providers. There might be some topics like sexual uh, issues that might be uncomfortable to talk about, but your provider might be able to really help you. So I encourage you to just be as open and as honest as you can. Keep a running list of symptoms, health status changes, and questions that you have for your doctor. And remember to be a strong advocate for yourself. You know your body better than anyone else, and so it's really important to communicate what you're experiencing with them. Um, you can include healthcare providers on other emails, and make sure you use the whole healthcare team. They're all there to support you, and don't give up. Now, keep in mind that feelings and challenges in life may come at you like waves, but remember, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. So at this time, we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can. Unfortunately, we only have a few minutes, so I am just going to try to field some of these um, and see what we can do to answer as many as we can. Um, keep in mind, uh, Dr. Serentopoulos is not able to give any medical advice. She's only going to be giving some uh, general guidance here, uh, but we will do our best to try to get back on these questions since we are limited on time today. Uh, so, Dr. Serentopoulos, one question I have for you is when and how is photophoresis used in the treatment of chronic graft-versus-host disease? That's a great question. Um, I didn't mention it at all as part of our armamentarium, but extracorporeal photophoresis um, ECP is a really important um, viable option, and we typically employ it when patients have sclerodermatous skin findings, um, but we do use it for other patients as well. Um, we're finding that 
although there is no you know standard way to employ it or how to employ it it's typically we wish we could but we can't because it's not convenient for patients actually um, so when it's appropriate it's usually when some when other agents aren't working um, when there's scleroderma that needs adjunctive therapy um, but I have to say that probably it's going to end up being something we use in conjunction with some of these other novel agents um, it would be great if we could study that to be certain, but on an individual basis, that's what we've been doing, at least at our center. Um, so, you know, and again, it takes time, so patience is important, and um, it's labor-intensive because patients have to come a couple times a week and um, for lots of sessions to have it be efficacious, but definitely a viable, um, really important option. Great. Thank you. Um, I have another question here about a person that's experiencing GVHD in many areas in their body, and they're curious if getting a cold or flu could ever bring that GVHD to the lungs. Yeah, that's also a good question. I mentioned getting um, pulmonary function tests as a way to kind of determine if the lungs are being affected and to have a way that we can early have early detection so we can preemptively you know, treat with that inhaler regimen that I mentioned, FAM. Um, I think if you have chronic graft versus, well, I know if you have chronic graft versus disease of other organs, you do want to get those pulmonary function tests anyway, even if you, you know, just, just to make that plug again, um, even if you feel like your lungs aren't affected, like you don't have respiratory symptoms, still get those tests just because that helps us uh, before anything shows up, okay? Um, but yes, if you get a cold or you get a rare weird virus, it's like you can get like kid viruses like RSV, you can even get that late um, after transplant. We've seen that not infrequently happen or the flu or whatever you get. Um, we do tend to see a drop in the uh, pulmonary function test during active infections. Um, but we have a hint that you may be more prone than, you know, just like any kind of injury to any part of your body. If you go and get sunburned, you're more apt to get GVHD of the skin. If you smoke, you're going to have a problem with your lungs. If you get a virus, you may have a problem with your lungs. So those are times when you go and you get a nasal wash and try to find out what virus it is and get supportive care, make sure that the infection isn't causing big grief and turning into a bacterial infection, all that. And then you're on watch. You know, Then you want to make sure that you get those pulmonary function tests and get seen. Um, maybe do a walk test in clinic to make sure that when you're walking, it's not just that, oh, you're overall tired, your body's tired, but maybe you have, you know, your oxygen saturation going down and you just weren't aware of it. So that, that's, that's when those tests come in especially handy. Thank you. Um, I have another question here, too. Uh, a listener says, I, said, I have heard that chronic graft-versus-host disease eventually burns itself out after five to seven years. Is that true? That is also a very astute, good question, and I know um, there, so, so if you look at a, the How I Treat that was written by Mary Flowers and Paul Martin at the Hutch, and if you look at what Paul Martin and Stephanie Lee put together in terms of a natural history study, watching patients over time, it's a really important um, research endeavor that they did, you know, they published. Um, what happens to people is, and the hope is that that would exactly happen, that you would sort of... I don't know if the word burnout or if it's just, um, you know, we, we in the immunology world think that your graft is then sort of just tolerating your foreign self uh, better, so tolerance or burnout. We think that probably those are synonymous, I guess. Um, but yes, over time, we would imagine and hope and we think it's true that you would, you would get tolerance to your host. The graft, the new graft gets tolerance. So the, the further you are, the better off you are. The chance of getting chronic graft versus host disease um, is much higher in the first year. If you don't get chronic graft versus host disease in the first year, although Sean told you his story, he was one of the outliers. After, um, you know, you have about a 15% chance of getting it after the first year, um, whereas you have, you know, much higher chance of getting it in the first year. Um, but if you do get it, it will over time, we hope, go get better. Uh, but, you know, we don't know what happens with weaning of immune suppression and flares that happen during the weaning time for some patients. And what was just recently um, discovered was that if you don't respond 
So the first wean, if you if you flare after your first wean of immune suppression, you should be sort of on watch for some, to be somebody who maybe you don't want to really wean very fast the next time, or maybe not at all. So we we have to take pause as a community. We haven't figured it out yet. We need to study it, but there is a suggestion that some people respond, go off of their medicines, and then sort of, like you say, burn out. And other people, they continue to flare. If you're one of the people who continues to flare, we might need to, as a community, um, study whether or not we need to stay on immune suppression forever. But I don't. That was a, I probably answered two questions there. But I think the answer is yes. Over time, you do kind of you, you do hope that you get tolerant or quote unquote burn out your chronic GVHD. Okay, and I think we're going to conclude with this one. Um, I saw several questions regarding IGVHD. Do you have some general recommendations um, for people that have maybe tried a variety of things? Anything that if you have a patient with any vision issues with chronic graft-versus-host disease that you would recommend? Yeah, eye findings, as everyone on the call knows, are the most um, daunting, uh, both for the people who are non-eye doctors like us in the bone marrow transplant world and for the patients because they sneak, you know, it sneaks up on you, but it's really life-altering to have eye problems. Um, what I do and what everyone um, does in the bone marrow transplant world is partner with expert eye doctors. So you really need to have an evaluation at a center who has an ophthalmologist who knows chronic graft versus host disease. And that that is for sure. So if you have eye findings, get at least an initial evaluation and a recommendation. Um, you know, we're really lucky here to have Victor Perez. You know, there are there are very few really expert chronic graft or host disease people, but there are great centers who recognize it and also, you know, equally treat it. I can tell you that next week there's going to be a chronic GVHD eye meeting. It's only on the eye. <laughs> it's headed by Sandeep Jain, and it's a sort of a research meeting, again, funded by the NIH. It is a problem that we're actively trying to understand and try to develop agents for, but there's no one recommendation. There just certainly is a need for an ophthalmologist. And as soon as you start having eye issues, you got to go to the ophthalmologist for an evaluation. And prefer, pre you know, preferably, that's somebody who knows about GVHD. Um, but you can start with a regular ophthalmologist. And then if they find something that looks like GVHD, maybe then seek out an expert chronic GVHD or GVHD of the eye expert. Okay, great. Well, again, I want to thank all of our speakers for being with us and all the callers here today. Just so you know, we have a couple wonderful upcoming events for you. Uh, we have a Lunch and Learn on October 21st about mindfulness. October 29th, we have a survivorship webinar. And then um, we also, of course, want to thank our sponsors again, Pharmacyclics, Insight Corporation, and the Meredith Cowden Foundation. And, of course, all of our link partners. We can't do what we do without you. And uh, just so everyone knows, a survey will be coming to you shortly. And uh, this webinar, again, it will be on our website within a few days. And if you go to the event resources, you can also print the slides. But again, thank you to everyone. We hope that this was helpful to you today. And you just have a great day. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar. All parties may disconnect. Have a great day.